Welcome to Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness with your hosts Chris Noble and Bill Perutzman. Today's episode is about frequencies and music. There's a lot to unpack here, from individual frequencies that relate to specific effects to their combination in the infinite variety of music. What's the best thing to use, music or a specific frequency? Which one has more power and why? How do I make sense of all this in a way I can put to work for my self-care? We'll be talking about all that and much, much more, as always in these open conversations, here on Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness. So, uh, you know, I, I love this idea of the use of sound and, and rhythm and, and music and frequencies and all of that. This is so important. I mean, it's better than not using it. Oh, right? yeah. It, yeah. Because it, it focuses our awareness. And we know, oh, this is doing something to me that, you know, maybe I want or maybe I don't want. But at least you were aware, you know, that that something's happening, that the rhythm is doing something. It's in training our heart and breath or the sound is doing something. It's killing cancer cells or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, the, the marvelous things. But uh, maybe the way that we need to approach this is like, what is a responsible use of sound and rhythm? What does that look like? You know, rather than using music to drive Noriega out of his, you know, uh, the cathedral that he was holed up in in Panama City or using it to torture people like they've done at Guantanamo. Um, what's a responsible use for music? And, and what does that look like for us as awareness builds in this world, right? Well, I've, and I think also, yeah, because then that gets into specifics, which is what types of things are you trying to accomplish with the music? Or um, what are the, because there's such a variety of purposes. We listen to music just by listening to regular music, we listen to it for so many different reasons when you really think about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then and then outside of all of that, for example, I just, you know, going through a breakup, I'm going to listen to my favorite breakup music. Oh, I'm going through uh, whatever, you know, you can just fill in the blank here. We use music for so many things already as a society. But what 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 about helping me sleep? You know, helping me, I've got a migraine. Is there music I can listen to for that? Um, I've got um, even honestly a stomach ache or my immune system is terrible today and I need to just listen to music that boosts my immune. Is there specific types of sounds and or music that we can listen to for these specific kinds of things, right? Right. Almost like a prescription, like you prescribe your clients, you know, here you guys need to listen to this kind of this type of music or whatever to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. So it's, it's like, we can get so detailed and I'm, and I'd love to do that a bit today, but that's really like, that's the, the question of like, what, what are the responsible ways of using sound and music? We're like, wow, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish with sound and music. Right. And there's this idea too, that we can apply a specific frequency or music or sound for a specific purpose. And then you flip that on its end when you're like, what music happens to you in a psychedelic trip, you really have no control over that. It's the other way around. The music is doing something to you versus you intending to do something with it. Mm. Does that make any kind of sense? I mean, it's one and the same thing really, but uh, like being vulnerable to whatever music has for you versus using music to do a specific thing. Yeah. And I think that goes into the difference between like, sometimes you just experience something unexpected and it has a great effect, like in any, like a concert and there's a song that just gets played and you've never heard before. And it oh, yeah, you just go, blows your mind oh, gosh, and yeah. you're, you start crying immediately or something, you know, and yeah. it's just magic. Um, or you're on a psychedelic and a song takes you somewhere you never would have expected to be taken. That's happened to me countless times on psychedelics and that wasn't planned. Right. So yeah. there's, there's certainly that side. And then of course, you know, I guess in like in any situation, then it's, I'm just trying to think of, ex- of examples. It's like, um, you know, do I, do I use my, use garlic to cook with and make a nice meal uh, with this extra addition of garlic? Or do I use the garlic for these medicinal properties that garlic is known for? And again, we can go down this huge list of just something like garlic as an example, right? It's like you can have these intentions and or you can experience garlic in a meal where it's just like, oh, I never expected that to taste so good or, you know, so it's, it's all about intention, application, but then the unknown 
side when you experience it at a, a sound healing or a concert or you're just listening to the radio and a new song comes on and blows your mind. So it, it we, can, we can go down a lot of avenues. Um, yeah, yeah. With this discussion, for sure. I love the garlic analogy because you know, it garlic is one of those things that you can use for a healing purpose, but that doesn't dilute the healing purpose of garlic in any combination that it might be found in. You know, as a flavor, as a main dish, like roasted garlic spread on toasted bread. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. getting hungry thinking about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right? a good analogy. And, it, and, it, and it's good because it shows that there's so many ways that that substance, whatever it is that's in garlic, uh, is beneficial for us. Mm-hmm. And in some ways that we crave, like we want things that are good for us. But if I came along with like the if I were able to synthesize the compounds that are in garlic that are good for us. And I came along and said, Chris, you've got to use this because this is so amazing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. You'd be like, well, Hey, why don't I just eat garlic? I'm using garlic all the time and everything I cook. What's the difference? Yeah. You know, uh, probably none, but I think that the, you know, one of the things that's difficult because we haven't got science on this is how do you sort of extract from a, any combination of flavors in a meal, <laughs> right? The ones that are beneficial and why, and the specific benefits of each of them. And how do we get from that to a place? Well, if I just took that substance by itself, everything would be great. You know, I've taken garlic capsules too, and yeah, that's probably good. But you know, why not just have it as part of the meal? And there's this notion, too, that the more of it we can have, like one capsule is good, but five capsules are great. Um, I don't know if that holds up very well either when we move the analogy back to music. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, you know, like, for example, um, the crystal healing bowls, crystal sound oh, yeah, healing yeah, yeah. bowls, right? Uh, most people, you know, really associate that with a sound healer, and that's their main instrument, and they are very powerful and effective and um some days the, you can play the same bowl and depending on where i'm at emotionally physically etc it's like i don't know um it, it's gonna have a different effect on me yeah. on that day right. and it's the same bowl doing same the bowl. same frequency creating the same binaurals but it's having a different effect because of what i'm moving through emotionally physically whatever and uh, and it's the same remedy, so to speak, or it's the same thing happening. Um, so once again, it starts to go down like, you know, I, I can imagine that all, especially when it comes to sound and frequency healing, we were just before we started recording for those listening, we we're talking about solfeggio frequencies and, you know, how, how do we know <laughs> what these solfeggio frequencies do. For example, uh, there's a, there's an array of different frequencies um, that were discovered several hundred years ago that have these particular effects such as, um, you know, repairing your DNA is one of them and uh, connecting to higher consciousness is another one and a whole slew of others. And first of all, how the heck did we discover that? How do we even know that that's true? Not to say it's not, but how do we know it's not you know, we don't have the really in-depth science still to, to to really go into why these frequencies are what they are and how, and how they're so effective doing what they do. But, you know, I kind of go back to like the, the crystal bowls where it's like, do they just have multiple freak, if multiple um, benefits, let's say, you know, and is it just one thing that they're doing or does it depend on the subject? Does it depend on the person with where they're at and what they're going to feel from that one specific frequency could be very, very different than what another person is going to feel and experience from that same frequency or that same healing bowl, same Tibetan bowl, you know? So I don't know really even where I'm going with this thought more that's that like it starts to rabbit hole into uh, (laughs) how many, there's probably a million different benefits perhaps from these things, from one thing. And uh, how do we, how, how can we, figure this out you know we need we need a better way of um measuring sound and frequency healing music healing and 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 whatnot and and that's where i get really excited where science as we can both see is is going in that direction thankfully we'll get more answers to these questions 
I like that it's individual, Chris. You know, I, I don't, may not like garlic, or I may not want it on a particular day, right? Yeah. And as long as you know, um, as long as you have some choices, some of them may work for you, some of them may not. Some of them may work all the time. Some of them may work only some of the time. But our ability to understand what works is something that needs to be developed, I think. Mm. So I could say to you, or at like you've said to me, so 40 hertz is great for memory, right? And, and apparently sleep. <laughs> and apparently sleep, <clears throat> as we know, yeah. <laughs> at least from my experience. Like I'm just one person, right? Yeah. But it might be great maybe working on my memory while I'm asleep. <laughs> Who knows? Good point. But if you, if you get to a place where, like me, you're interested in 40 hertz, you go, well, let's see how this works on me, right? So you do the experiment with it, and perhaps you do it more than once. So I've been in 40 hertz states a couple of times, and I love it because I can just bliss out, right? I just completely check into that middle place between being fully awake and being fully asleep. Um, that's a great effect. Whatever else is happening... I know that it'll do that, right? So I'm not going to do this driving down the freeway. <laughs> no. But when I need a break, and, and I think that the fact that we're all interested in, in trying to figure this out, and what is it like 516 hertz is good for, I don't know, whatever, something. It's good for something, right? I pick a thing. I don't know, whatever it is. Um, if I get that effect and I can notice that and there's something that I can tell about my own self that's had that effect, great, cool. Bring on 516 hertz. On the other hand, um, maybe it's how you combine it with other stuff. So 516 hertz by itself, I'm just picking a number here, so don't hate on me, guys. Maybe that's a great thing, but combined with 432 hertz, maybe the combination of those two tones does something that's even more remarkable you know, than before. Or maybe I'm listening to a passage of music, and it happens to hit a note that's 516, a note that's 432 along its way to wherever it's going. Mm -hmm. And I get the benefits of both in sort of a linear fashion. And how does that change the way that I experience and receive those two frequencies? And um, see, all of that is the fascinating stuff for me, it, rather than the isolation of the thing. I mean, Bill, you're making me think of a lot of things here, which one is that if you think about, we are all vibrational beings, right? This isn't just new right, age. Right. Talk. We know this from quantum mechanics. We're all in a state of vibration, string theory. Everything that makes up matter, everything is in a state of vibration, is in a yeah. state of, of string theory vibration. Much like when you pluck a guitar string and you see it vibrate, everything in reality is doing that on a subatomic um, level when it comes to matter, when it comes to what makes up the physical world. So, so therefore, we're all vibrating. But everything in matter, as we also know, are all a series of different frequencies. So everything that makes up matter is going to be a series of different frequencies. If it was all the same, we'd all look like a gray blob probably. Right, yeah. Right? So we all have to have a literally almost limitless array of different frequencies that make up our physical body, let alone the rest of the universe. And so... Sure, because like, you know, the, the frequencies that kill cancer cells are completely different than the frequencies that the rest of our cells, which are healthy, are vibrating at which is why it's so effective is because they can zero in on the they resonant frequency yeah. of that particular cell that virus whatever boom eradicate it nothing else gets hurt not like dropping a nuke on it like chemo does and so that's why that is successful and i'm just wondering too and you're like well when you're talking about could that frequency then work with 432 and then you can combine these things it's like well of course you can because our whole bodies are doing it constantly and the whole universe is, is mixing in frequencies all the time. So the idea of mixing in uh, a series of different frequencies, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me that that's not only possible, that's likely once we, once let's fast forward a couple of decades or a century when, when we really accept that this is the way to go with medicine, and all of a sudden we're, we're diving into like the most mainstream, you know, uh, research organizations, et cetera, are now pouring millions or billions of research into this. And we know all of this. I wonder what that's going to say, because I guarantee you, it just gets more and more complicated in the best way, because you're going to start to be like, well, this one remedy mixes 432, but only for five seconds. And then you, you take that out and then it's got three other frequencies mixed in here, just like we have complicated medicines, right? Why would right, it be any right. different with frequency? Yes. Sometimes it can be very, very simple and very effective. 40 Hertz, boom, you're knocked out, done, easy. But 
And I you guarantee what, I, you. With respect to 40 hertz, I should say this about your composition with 40 hertz. It's not just one tone, oh, 40 hertz the whole time. Right. There's music happening around this foundational frequency. So there's other music that sort of takes your interest, right? And 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 takes you on a on a journey. Imagine what you could do if you composed music that had like the 40 hertz in it. So you, the, whoever the person is is out, like in theta state. And also like the cancer killing frequency, right? Which we can't right. hear. But if it was in there, <laughs> you could have like the, the 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 sweetest rest of your life for two hours or however long the piece lasts. I think it's two hours. Plus, you know, you eradicate all the cancer cells in your body. <laughs> now, I, you know, this is this is not science fiction. People, they're doing this. But is that ethical as a sound healer? I mean, do we need to tell people, look, you're going to get all these frequencies and then blah, 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 and then five, six million, you just lay out the whole table, like all 25 of whatever they are. Right. And oh, by the way, we're also going to do 40 hertz, which is not on those sulfeggio tones, but is good for this. And we're going to do this amazingly high frequency that kills cancer cells, which is not on the list. Right. Can you, can you do that as a sound healer and make some claims about it? Well, that's where it gets tricky. I mean, I'm a big believer in transparency when it comes to pretty much anything, right? So I, I want transparency from all the major institutions that are creating anything from our food to med medicine and everything like that. And we don't, we don't re usually typically ever get it from them, unfortunately. Um, but we need that. And there's a reason we have an ingredients label on all of uh, products that we eat or consume. <laughs> so every piece of music would have a disclaimer. These are the frequencies we're using. <laughs> Well, and it sounds crazy, but I'm like, I don't know, Bill, like I would be more on that side of like, I'd rather let everyone know everything that they're getting. And so they can use their own discernment to know if that's what they need. Now, let's say in a concert, maybe when you're coming to a concert and you're just coming for an experience, then we don't maybe need to go down the the, the shopping list of the, the the ingredients list of everything. That might just be overkill, and it's part of the mystery mystery and the kind of cool nature of the experience of the concert is to just kind of go feel it out and then see what happens. Maybe I mentioned a couple of major frequencies, but everything else is just we're just going to sprinkle it in. You know, it's also like um, a lot of the times when people smoke cannabis or consume cannabis they're not aware but they're also usually the cannabinoids and lots not all but lots of different strains of cannabis have cancer killing properties to them so they're while they're getting high and having a fun time perhaps recreationally they're also killing cancer cells without even knowing it so i, I don't this know train of thought, right? by the way. i really do love this train of thought <laughs> me too <laughs> and just asking the questions you know to sort of pulls the awareness to the next place and that, that I think is, is probably, if we're going to do this sound healing thing with any kind of responsible um, uh, demeanor, I don't know, what, what would be, what would we call that? Uh, I think it's a good idea to sort of be open about these things and say to people, hey, here's what you're getting. We don't know <laughs> how this is going to affect you, but at least you know what you're getting. Well, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I, I, you know, you're, you can make your own choices. Hey, I don't feel like hearing anything in C major today, so I'm not coming. Yeah. Right. And, you know, wouldn't that level of sophistication be really wonderful to see? I wish we had that level of transparency in a lot of things uh, around us right now. And I just, I, again, that's where I, that's where I would come back is like, I'd rather be fully open and honest and have like that open forum idea of, I don't have anything to hide here guys. And, and guess what? We never know exactly what anything is in reality. The fact that, yeah, that any institution can come out and say this a thousand percent works and this thousand percent doesn't work. We've talked about this in many other episodes before. That just isn't how life works. Science is constantly evolving and anyone who thinks that what we think currently is fact and that will remain fact for the rest of history is, I mean, come on, we've seen this. We can look back through history and see a million different examples of this always not being the case. Things change all the time. Every, everything we think is fact changes. Therefore, what is actually fact? But I think if we're just honest and we're like, look, this is what we know so far. And I, most scientists who I've talked to, they all, they all say the exact same thing. They're like, science is what we know up to right now, yeah, up today, to now. up to today, tomorrow, tomorrow, whole other story, right? So who's the, who's the mushroom guy? Uh, Paul Stam Stamets? Uh, the guy from uh, Fantastic Fungi? Yeah, from Fantastic yeah. Fungi. Okay, so uh, he published a study, and his study was based on what the scientists would call anecdotal evidence. He had people fill out a survey after using mushrooms, not magic mushrooms, but just regular mushrooms, right? 
okay. all the stuff they sell. They said, so tell me your effects. And thousands of people responded, here's what I experienced. So why not do something similar to that with music? Mm. You know, and and sort of crowdsource the results. Have a hundred people do a you know a response to forty hertz music or something. Yeah. And see what the results are. Don't tell them in advance what it's supposed to do. Of course, it's yeah. Not for that because we already have, you know, have a hundred people do four hundred thirty-two concert and have a whole hundred people do a four forty concert. And see what the results are. See if there's any differences. See what people without knowing, you know, what's yeah. underneath the hood, and and just sort of find out what these effects really are. Really are in our current world today. I mean, and they could have been different, as lots of people have pointed out. You know, we heard things differently a long time ago, and we'll probably hear things differently in the future. But a, a crowdsourced response like that would be really useful at this point. It would be great, you know, and it just more of this discussion is making me think I've been doing a lot of work on my um, my Ancient Mysteries on Earth YouTube channel and organization yeah, yeah. that's all about the ancients and all about the wisdom from the past that honestly blows your freaking mind because they knew so much at certain points in history, far more than we even know today. And that's that's the cool thing about alternative history and looking at these things from a different angle is that we don't, we were not as primitive as we might have been taught. And one of the really cool things that I, I was looking through some of my old Egypt footage a couple of days ago, and man, I just forgot how a lot of those pyramids um, certainly were not for burials or for mummies. No mummies have ever been found in the Great Pyramid, for example. So that's just like, it's a theory that we're taught in school. It's simply a theory with actually not a lot of evidence. But um, these were acoustic chambers. You know, these were, these, let's look at the Great Pyramid, for example. I've been doing a lot of research I, again on that more recently because it's one of the biggest smoking guns to show very, very, very highly advanced technology in the ancient past. And what they're doing is creating an acoustic amplification machine of some kind. And there's tons of really amazing research to go into with just with this theory. But the reason I was thinking about it when you were talking about all these different ideas of what frequency can be used for is like these ancients understood frequency to the degree that I was just saying like, man, in a hundred or a couple hundred years, it'd be so cool when we really know actually what's, what's going on. And then we could combine a whole variety of frequencies together. Well, that's what they were doing yeah, with these yeah. very advanced constructions, but acoustic chambers to do what? We don't exactly know, but some of the things that I have come across with my research is that they're able to extract the frequencies from our planet. And our planet is, of course, like we said, everything is emitting frequency, everything is in vibration. Well, so obviously our planet is, but then our planet has these hot spots or vortexes all around the planet. You could even call it the chakra system of our own planet. And there's these energy hubs of very amplified, let's call them earth energies. And yeah, the ancients yeah. knew all about them. So did our, you know, uh, indigenous people and the, uh, the um, First Nations people of North America and stuff, they knew all about this stuff already. But anyway, the ancients did too. So they would build these pyramids on these hotspots and then amplify the frequency energy using geometry, which is why it's in the shape of a pyramid. But then also with the ratio, how big it's built, its size is in ratio to the energy that's being emitted from that place. And all that, when I was inside the Great Pyramid, it was, like I've said in previous episodes, an incredible acoustic chamber where your voice reverberates for 10 seconds or, or longer. Yeah. And uh, outside of the fact that it's just so cool to hear that, and outside of the fact that it does totally induce uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, you know, heightened perception experiences, etc., spiritual experiences, outside of all that, it's so obviously designed to to move frequency and to channel frequency because it's an acoustic chamber and so and in, in the granite and the crystalline granite and the um the uh limestone granite and all these like different types of rock and minerals that were used to build it are all built to basically channel frequency and to do a lot of different things with it you know one would be to simply create power um, and that's where Nikola Tesla was using the same technology and was able to create free energy through using just the uh, frequency um, power from our own planet Earth and then the ionosphere of our planet. So you connect the ionosphere to the Earth and then boom, you've got it, you know, clean, clean and free energy for the, for the world, basically. So long story short, these ancient uh, constructions knew 
what we're talking about today to such a more in-depth degree because why would they build insanely complex difficult structures that what were they really doing we still don't know but what it seems to be the more research going into it is that they're using frequency and they're and they're channeling it and they're somehow amplifying it and and using it for i don't know a whole slew of different things but so you know maybe some of these questions and answers that we're talking about or questions that we're talk, asking today you could even look into the very distant past to at least get a hint because i guarantee you they were using them for health they were using them for building things like you find the resonant frequency type in youtube acoustic levitation that's a real thing yes, yes. type into youtube uh, those of you listening acoustic levitation and you'll see these cool laboratory videos of levitating marbles and ping pong balls and just with sound just with sound just with sound so you can use frequency for literally anything and of course the military i mean you can go down that if you can we can also weaponize it just as much as it's great for healing you can absolutely weaponize it and the military has done this for decades decades and decades they've done this and there's you know crowd control frequency things that have been used in many protests over the last two years especially and so on and so forth. This just keeps going. So frequency has infinite applications. But when it comes to our question today of, yeah, like, how do we how do we measure it? How do we use it with when it comes to sound and music healing? That's that's where the rabbit hole really gets big, because we can we can go into literally infinite a, a, amount of ways. And maybe some of the hints can be looked into uh, the ancient distant past of how to do that. But it's you, it's mind blowing. When you were talking about inside the interior of the Great Pyramid, you used the word move to move energy. And I often wonder if the frequency acolytes are aware of how this moves, of how a frequency is supposed to move something along. Um, Sometimes, like if you're using your microwave oven, that's a frequency generator, and it moves the temperature, it, it increases, you know, increases the activity of the molecules and whatever you're cooking. Uh, so it moves energy higher. Um, do you have any kind of a sense of what the ancients were trying to do with this, to move this energy? Yeah, it's a great question, Bill. One thing we definitely know for sure, because we've actually experimented with this, and there's actually um, Russia, for example, they actually build pyramids in Russia, not pyramids like the Great Pyramid, and they're not built out of like granite and all that stuff, um, but they do build them. And one of the main reasons is actually just to enhance crops in agriculture. Um They've, uh, John Burke, uh, he's a, um, a, a biologist, but also, uh, what's the term when it's electricity and biology mixed together? But anyway, he's a, a biology, um, something <laughs> like that. So he studies electricity in nature and he, uh, studied, he did over a thousand studies, uh, worldwide at different ancient sites, Stonehenge, you know, the Great Pyramid, uh, different Mayan temples and, and so forth. And he, with the he went in with the intention he has a great book called uh oh i can't remember exactly but uh something about the seeds of, of so basically what the experiment was was he took these and he was using very sophisticated equipment he's quite a highly credentialed scientist so he's really high-end equipment to do this and he would go around to all these different sites and measure the electricity generated at these sites and they would fluctuate at different points. Usually he found when, when nighttime was turning into daytime, that would be the highest point of electric, electrical generation. And so these sites, a lot of them would generate natural electricity. And then um, only within the complex of this, of, this, of this site also, because then he would measure outside of the site and then boom, drop awesome. significantly. Yeah. yeah, it was really interesting. So one of the things, the main experiments that he did was he would take different um, crop seeds and he would have a control group outside and then a, and then the seeds inside the complex or the pyramid or the temple. And the ones that grew inside the temple were four to something like eight times uh, healthier, larger. It just would provide a much greater yield to these crops. So uh, Russian scientists have taken that in, in modern times and they actually build these and have really amazing results for crops. Now you can take that idea. So that's what we've measured. So we know that that's definitely happening. Um, but you know, crops, you can easily juxtapose that to the human body. Sure. And like, how would that not basically enhance the human consciousness and in, in your body altogether? Well, it, it does. And that's why, 
Some people go into these pyramids. Sometimes they go underneath these pyramids and have even more profound effects because perhaps different areas have different frequencies, like we were saying. And yeah, yeah. and so I've heard stories. This is all anecdotal, of course. This isn't scientific studied uh, yet. This is anecdotal, but. I've heard of people curing cancer, curing their asthma, things like that by going under certain pyramids, just going into the tunnels underneath. Um, I've certainly had emotional and very, very spiritual, like massive shifts in my consciousness happen in these places. And so they're definitely doing something on a, on a physio physiological and metaphysical level uh, to the human body. So there's definitely an interaction with the human body going on with these. But, you know, Basically, like what we've got a lot of scientific evidence to support is that they really enhance crops. And I think we can look at them as maybe overall general enhancement technologies so that everyone nearby would just feel better. You'd feel healthier. The plants are growing healthier. Crops are growing healthier. The water's probably healthier. And just, just keep going down that list where it's likely just an overall enhancement tool, perhaps. That's that's kind of where I'm thinking that's going. Is there any um, possible sort of alignment with intention? We talked about uh, observer bias before, but if our intention is for this thing and we put stuff in place that we feel might support this thing, and it does, <laughs> you know, the quantum entanglement suggests that that's a result of our intention rather than of the stuff we put in place. Although it might yeah. be some combination of both. I can't see how it's one or the other, to be honest with you, Chris. I think it's probably yeah. both, but it's probably amplified by intention. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, so for example, you go into one of these pyramids, right, um, with the intention of having an experience or the intention of healing something, your likelihood of that happening is far higher than it yeah, just that, happening naturally. That sort right? of opens the vulnerability, opens the, uh, I don't know, it's not vulnerability, it's, it's like it welcomes the energy. Yeah, maybe it goes back to that word you're using, like moving or shifting your energy, yeah. and, and that's because of your intention actually interacts with those particle, those waves, those frequencies, and your your intention is a frequency because our minds literally are shooting whatever our thoughts are. Our our thoughts are measurable it's a vibration, right? Yeah. They're vibration too. Everything is right. Yeah. So our thoughts are actually shooting out of us interacting with the physical world around us and so why wouldn't it have that effect on um any of these ancient sites what would right they synchronize with or or harmonize with i yep. i um i'm trying to find language that talk about frequency and the best kind of language that i found so far is not so much that we're aligned or in tune but in harmony with yeah which yeah. means to me that i'm not fighting it you know somebody's playing 516 at me i'm like oh i don't like 516 i'm, I'm gonna take 432. And I'm just choosing numbers off the top of my head. People don't, don't hate on me. Right. But if, if I'm not going to sing 516 and I want to sing 432, um, that could turn out to be a really beautiful harmony. Yes. Yeah. And when, when you have harmony, so take a look at waveforms, if you can find a, a scope to do this anymore, but when you blend waveforms, you get a third waveform and that waveform also contains you know, funny thing you should bring it up bill binaural beats right <laughs> and all of that blending of waveforms of frequencies also has a beneficial effect that you can measure in a completely different way because the the number of beats in a binaural beat are not the same as the original beats going in yeah on like 516 so uh th this is fascinating stuff but it's obviously extensible in ways that are that invite harmonic resonance right singing two notes that blend or they invite another I, I heard recently somebody said oh that rhymes with what i've been thinking mm, like, interesting you know the words were different but the concept was the same so there was uh like a semantic rhyme going on we were saying two different sets of words that meant the same thing in the end I, it's like it's when two things are working or when multiple things are working together it creates harmony and we we use that when we're talking about peace you know peace love and harmony and that's not about music it's it's about people right communities yeah. society coming together in harmony so you know it's 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 like it's it's kind of almost hidden in our own language how much we are all frequency and vibration i mean think about everyone uses and we i think we've even talked about this in a previous podcast too where you know you, you talk to someone they're like oh i really liked his vibe or i really didn't like her vibe or i went into this really cool restaurant and it had a nice vibe to it 
everyone's saying vibration. They're all right. saying this is the vibration of this person, the vibration of this place, the vibration of this experience was good or bad or made me feel X, whatever that fill in Some the blank. Fundamental way that we all <laughs> have this. It's like reducing it to its lowest common denominator. And that's vibration. We can't really talk about anything lower than that, but we agree that it, that is in fact what it is. <laughs> well, light, everything we see everything is we vibration. See. Light is a vibration. It's a frequency. You know, temperature is a frequency. Um, everything is. I mean, even um, in the great creation myths, they all talk about the universe being sung into existence. Certain uh, The Aboriginal people of Australia, I believe, talk about the universe being sung into existence, not the great, like the yes. Big Bang, and yes. then here's all this. It's like, no, there was a sound before all that. Like frequency sound comes before. Even though sound, as we think, is slow in its speed, it's actually frequency. It's not like when we say sound, we're thinking of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, which is the human range of audible sound. That's right. not every, that's not everything in the universe, of course, right? That's there's a billions, trillions, exponential more frequencies out there. Even in the Bible, God said, let there be light. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 subtle in some of these religious texts, but you can go into so many different creation myths, and it's always sound um, comes before the light and the visual and everything else. So yeah, when you bring it all back down to it's the lowest common denominator, it's vibration or or sound, whatever you want to call it, because that's what everything is. Do you wonder sometimes? And I know that they've got measurements on this, but do you wonder what? what the sound of a black hole might be. Where, where <laughs> Haven't they tried there? to measure that? I think yeah. there's NASA's I, got some stuff. There's there. some recordings you can go online. I think you can actually hear, you know, what they've been able to decipher that's sonic from a black hole. But where that's everything audible. Else is gone. Yeah. Is there it's an amazing thing to me anyway that, that vibration still manages to escape <laughs> from yeah. from a black hole. And, right, you know, and in all of the matter that we don't know, the dark matter that we don't know, where there's nothing measurable to vibrate, what is the sound of that space like? Right, and is it is it is it when we say sound, right? It's like is it or we're just, we're just talking audible? Doesn't yeah. mean it's not not there. It's audible sound, right? right? Is there? There's. I mean, I've heard things that there's um, research that they've started to discover. Uh, planets that are outside of galaxies and have uh, potential at least of life. And I've heard whistleblowers and stuff talk about like, absolutely, there's life on these places because they're operating at completely different frequencies, completely and utter different frequencies that don't need um, necessarily the things that we think you need to be to live and like organic life, the way organic, we're... intelligent life, yeah. perhaps, you know. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, really it's like this whole universe really is just a big playpen of creation because uh, when it comes to vibration, literally anything is possible. Anything. Anything. If you can think it, it's happening somewhere. Yeah. Well, if you, if you thought you've created it. Exactly. Which is another kind of wild thing to consider. Yeah. Like, do our thoughts create? And if you're talking to law of attraction people, absolutely they do. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking to artists and musicians, absolutely they do. Or quantum physicists, you know? Quantum physicists, absolutely they do, right? So yeah. there's this whole thing of, you know, thought is in fact everything. So it makes sense to use it well, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Instead of zoning out on 40 hertz. But you know what? Sometimes it's just the silence that that means so much. And I wanted to ask you this too. When you were in the Great Pyramid, was there ever a moment of silence? Were you able to experience that there? Yeah, definitely, because some of these places, they have a really amazing effect on every person going in there. And one of the main things I find in these sacred spots and sacred sites are it gets quiet so naturally. Um, a lot of people, they go in and you're just like, you're almost forced into contemplation because oh, of like the you're, feeling. You're in there, you're like, hey, oh, well, hey, Chris, look at this, look at that, and all of a yep. sudden you feel like you're Zoom. talking too loud. <laughs> yep, you do. You really do. You f and no one has to tell you to shut up. It's uh, it's a very innate feeling. And while yeah, we were leading some chants, and certainly we were talking throughout most of it. There were pockets where it got very quiet, and um, that's where you start to feel frequencies rather than hear them. Uh, because there's no such thing as silence, really. 
And uh, it's maybe just that we can't, again, the 20 to 20,000 hertz spectrum that our ears pick up is not mo- really registering anything. But, you know, the, frequ- the frequency of the pyramid, for example, the Great Pyramid, well, actually, the, <laughs> the resonant frequency of the Great Pyramid is 432 hertz. Yeah. And uh, that's obviously audible, but you're not, like, when I was in there, it felt like um, like a throbbing Vroom, vroom, vroom kind of like feeling, not a sound. I wasn't yeah, hearing this vroom. You could get the. I could feel some sort of a, a pulse almost from what this. What happens like if you were to touch one of the interior walls? Could you feel a vibration in the wall the way you feel when you play the piano? You're not feeling a vibration like, yeah, when you play a piano, you feel the table vibrate or something, yeah, right? Or, the, or yeah. the keys. You know, it's not as palpable as that. Now, keep in mind, every site I, we're talking about here, too, these are in a state of ruin. They're not operational anymore. Yeah. Um, yet they're still having an effect, which is crazy, which is mind blowing, I think. But they're, they're operating at like a 5% capacity of what they used to be, which is pretty mind blowing because it, they still operate. I mean, the fact that they're even still. Because they're working on a different form of technology, which is completely in harmony with their planet. Therefore, if the planet's still going, so is the site, you know, even in a ruined, completely ruined state. I mean, the Great Pyramid, is, its its outer casing is completely gone. It was actually cased in a yeah, white a kind slick. of uh, granite, very yeah. slick with a gold top to it. Yeah. So with a gold top that actually was gold um, over top of crystal. So it was like a huge crystal with gold over top of it, which just would have been insanely powerful and, and and basically was generating a global grid of pyramids because there's pyramids all on every continent. Um, what were they all doing? Well, we definitely theorized that it was a global power grid, but um, yeah, like even in a ruined state, you know, you're feeling something, but it's not like um, I put my hand on the walls many times and I wasn't feeling a palpable vibration, but then at the same time, my whole body felt like it was in a bit of a different vibration. Like, you know, when you have too much coffee and you're almost got the jitters, Yeah, it felt like yeah. that with, without the anxiety and without the negative kind of feelings that come with that. It just felt like your body's almost like shaking a little bit because of the frequency shift. Not again, not very noticeably. I wasn't like freaking out shaking, but if I just slowed down and looked and just tuned into my own self, I, I you feel very, uh, a shift. You feel a shift for sure. That is, well, that's, freaking cool because we want to feel that (laughs) how many of us are at this place where we'd just like to experience anything other you know than more of the same yeah and hey if if specific frequencies do that great you know maybe we maybe we should market a a frequency generator for our flat things you know that people could just dial in and they could have it right at their fingertips maybe something exists like that if you know about it let us know we'll post it in the show notes but um get let's get some experience with this on a, on a wider scale. Yeah. And, and who cares? I mean, maybe it's nice to know that, you know, specific frequency is good for a specific thing, but I mean, at the end of the day, what frequencies do it for you? Yeah. You know? Right. Like we you just said, Bill, like uh, garlic, right. Going back to that one, like right, some right. different people are going to have different reasons that they're using it or, or not using it. Right. Yeah. And it's not a right or wrong. I mean, we're not trying to be all judgmental about this. It's really cool that this variety exists. And the invitation is wide open for us to go into it and see what happens, you know? Yeah. And one thing that's pretty obvious is that you're not going to get hurt if you use like volume levels, decibel levels that are low enough so they don't blow your ears. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> and for heaven's sake, if you're feeling any kind of an ill effect when you're trying this stuff, then stop because, yeah. you know, there's no requirement that you push through it to your own detriment change the frequency, you know, play around with what, what in fact feels good. I, I hate to say it that way, but there's just really no other way to do that. But there's no other way to, to know? discern what it's going to be until you get, you got to use your feelings, people. Like yeah. we've have those senses for a reason and it, and it can't just be logical, dial it in. And then yeah. it can't, don't let your brain lead the way with a lot of this. Like yeah, the head brain doesn't have this one. <laughs> the, the heart brain. The heart brain. Heart brain. Anyway, for heart sure. math, right? Just to throw in heart math here. Great resource for this stuff. Check out heart math. Uh, and you know, I I didn't get it in time for my last newsletter, but my next newsletter, I want to publish your ancient uh, sort of research stuff because it's so yeah. tied into all of these musical things. It's fundamentally part of what you know. <laughs> we as as poor little musicians these days who don't have any idea what we're really doing. Uh, are doing, in fact, to connect to this ancient wisdom without really knowing it, you know? 
It's We're just remembering a lot of ancient technology, really. That's the cool thing. That's what I hated history in school because I thought it was it was just the most boring thing ever. And then I realized, of course, the uh, the other side of our history, the um, the more uh, what's great non colonial version of yes. uh, of our history yes. is so so bloody interesting, and the mysteries are so incredible that. It's the most fascinating thing we could. I find I can even be doing. It's better than watching a science fiction film. Is looking into our um, the distant and ancient past of who we actually were and why the heck were these things built and these sophisticated you know structures built. And the cool thing too is like that. I'll I'll be the link that Bill is going to share with people is I'm going to be traveling pretty much constantly now for the next God I don't even know year or so. Um, I'm going to be starting in Mexico doing a lot of research to the Mayan temples down there, and then probably going further south down to South America to do more, and I'll just be continually posting more information. But one of the really big things I want to do is incorporate music into these sites. Um, I've heard there's a really interesting branch of uh, archaeology called archaeoacoustics. Oh, cool. And yeah, that's actually a real thing. You can, you can study archaeoacoustics now because they're starting to see that acoustics, sound, frequency, vibration, goes hand in hand with most of these sacred sites. We're talking even Stonehenge. Um, we're talking a lot of these temples down in South America, of course, and and anything that's still slightly put together still and not completely, completely ruined. Yeah. Um, they all have acoustic properties. There's an amazing underground city in Turkey. Um, I forget the name of it, and it's already an amazing uh, structure unto itself because it was built into the rock and could house thousands of people. I mean, very sophisticated drilling technology that would be needed to make this. But there's a there's a place, there's a room in this underground structure where you can stand and speak, and your voice is carried throughout the entire structure. Wow. Through just the use of acoustics and geometry, they were able to create basically an ancient PA, an ancient... Uh, you know, uh, announcement system. Everyone in the cave, uh, we've got, uh, you know, turkey uh, cooking tonight for the community. You gotta come get your gravy later, you know. Whatever the announcements were, they wouldn't need a microphone. They could stand in a particular spot designed with these acoustics in mind so that they could bounce off everything and, and travel throughout the entire pretty big complex. Like, these people understood acoustics better than we have any clue today. So yeah, it, it is, if you want some answers for the present and or the future, ironically, looking into the past might be the way to go. And ask a musician. <laughs> Honestly, because these sites, you know, you interact with them musically and things happen. And um, when I had a well, probably my most intense spiritual experience at a sacred circle site in um, South Africa called uh, Adam's Calendar, my uh, good friend, uh, she's an art therapist, and she had her ceremonial flute, and she was playing this flute inside the uh, you know ruin of an ancient stone circle, like a a mini Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. and um, that flute, that when she started playing that flute was when I started getting all of my downloads, and I was already having a pretty cool experience as it was before that. But then she started playing, and everyone commented that. Once she started to play that flute, it, it rose everyone's spiritual experience to a whole other level. And that's where I started getting, I felt like um, an actual sort of voice of uh, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, the the, the or maybe my higher self, who knows. But information and words were really coming into my, uh, my, my existence and it was making me immediately cry without even knowing why I was crying. But, but her flute playing was a big part. So yeah, musicians... Those of you listening and, and hobbying musicians, people who are just musical, we're all musical, let's be honest, but people that are more inclined to music, you know, if you're at these sites, interact with them, sing, chant, speak, you know, see what happens. Bring an instrument. These are, um, these are really cool experiments to try, and it, and it all comes from music, which is really cool. I'm remembering playing Rayman right now because there's that stone circle that's like the portal where everything jumps off. Mm. I don't know if you're a Rayman fan or played it before. If you're listening to this, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while. But one of the things that happens in that space is flute music. Oh. So you're in this circle and there's this ethereal flute music, you know, that anyway. So, yes, <laughs> somebody's been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Something's happening. I'll Something's tell you that. Happening. And it's the it's the indigenous and the usually the native people that have way better an idea of what's going on because they used to do this all the time. 
Excuse me. And uh, this is ancient knowledge that we're just remembering. But man, when we uh, get science and modern day thinking and scientists involved in this old way of, of doing things, man, we're in for a treat because this is so just cool. While you're on this mega journey of discovery, um, we're going to continue to do podcasts. And I want to make sure that people get links to what you're doing currently. So as you're listening to this now, uh, here's forewarning. Subscribe somewhere. Uh, find us in whatever way that is so that you can stay up on Chris's journey and the discoveries that he makes along the way and support him via Patreon because Patreon page is a big way that we musicians and podcasters and other creatives sort of make our, um, sustain our work. Yeah. And so absolutely. I want to make sure listeners, you'll have a way to be able to do that as well. It's, uh, this is fascinating anticipating this journey. Yeah, it's really cool. I'll definitely be sharing links with Bill as I go through all this stuff and um, links to the YouTube channel, which is free for everyone to watch. There's also a, um, a monthly membership community outside of Patreon just for the Ancient Mysteries on Earth um, researchers. If you're really a diehard into this nerdy stuff, it's a great community. We can meet like-minded people for like 10 bucks American a month. Um, so I'll send that all to Bill. That's going to be there. And then, you know, for those of you listening on the flip side of this, Bill's got an amazing program, uh, an experience, and it, it ties oh, into yeah. what we're talking about. <laughs> Ananda Maya. <It, laughs> well, Ananda Maya is so, uh, so Bill sent me this wonderful video of basically outlining what the experience is. And f first and foremost, I got to get into, I got to get into being a participant with this because it just Dude, looks yeah, we'd love like to have you. bliss and out. So the very, the very least, you're going to just feel amazing let alone, I'm sure, the downloads and uh, perhaps out-of-body experiences induced, who knows. But, I mean, I would love for the last little bit of our podcast, if you could just explain to our listeners, like, what that is. Because, it, because <laughs> Bill, it's a, great, it's a great example. No, for those who are listening, this is not uh, me just plugging this for, for Bill here. Because no, I'm laughing I, because I don't know how to explain it, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you're, you're going to do your best because we never know what the hell we're talking about on this podcast yeah, anyway. Sure. But, um, but for those of you listening, you know, we, we're, we're talking about this also offline, which is, you know, how do we apply all this stuff we're talking about? How the heck do you even apply it? And what Bill's offering is a really tangible way to like just experience it and apply it to maybe something you're going through physically or emotionally in your life that could be uh, really, really alleviated or brought new light and, and information into just by experiencing um, the events that, that Bill puts together. So yeah, what's really going on to the best of yeah, your knowledge? To the best of knowledge. So <laughs> I can tell you what it looks like and then we can go from there to the experience. So uh, I have done like music for healing purposes for a long, long time. Uh, with the piano and the keyboard and other stuff. And that's sometimes showing up in a band of military veterans who are playing cover songs and they were all experienced homelessness or being blown up or in recovery or something like that together. And it's a real honor to be a part of those groups because that band, for example, went out and played for recovery sessions, you know, all around. So um, it's been wonderful to be a part of that. Along the way, I got to know a woman who played Tibetan bowls inside a jail and led meditations and stuff with these bowls, which is remarkable that you could get the bowls into a jail anyway, but um, she was doing this work and uh, we stayed in touch. And sometime, I don't know, it's about a year ago, I guess, Chris, when I, I sent her an email and said, hey, would you like to work together? Like figure out if we can actually make a program with Tibetan bowls and keyboard. And long story short as we did, it's called Ananda Maya. And <laughs> you're, you're wise to say, I'll do my best to say what it is. But what it is, if you were to see it, is a bunch of Tibetan bowls, gong, some other interesting percussion indigenous instruments, uh, like rain sticks and drums and things, uh, a keyboard, and a bunch of sort of nature sounds that I can dial up and use at will, all presented in the form of a musical journey. And we did these videos to show that and to get responses from people who had experienced the journey saying what it was like for them. And the responses are, they're, they're everywhere. They go all over the place. Um, all positive. We haven't had anybody say, oh, that's stupid. Go away. Don't do that. <laughs> you know. But one of the things that's common to everyone is in these audiences, and I love this, Chris, it takes all the pressure off, is that the audience is like lying on the ground on yoga mats for indoors or on something if we're outdoors, uh, oftentimes with an eye pillow, so the eyes are closed, they're in this blissed out state of complete acceptance and vulnerability. There's no pressure to like 
hit the right notes. You know, you're not trying to recreate anything that's ever happened before in musical life. You're completely free to make the music, whatever it will be in the moment, and to allow that to speak to the folks who are there to absorb it. And uh, <laughs> from all of the responses so far, the, the absorption has been good, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, and so I'll post the, the link. You can see the videos and stuff and learn a little bit more about me and Dion Mandel, who's a Tibet bowl master, runs a school for teaching people to play these amazing uh, energy devices. But it, it's been really wonderful to experience music in this way myself because everything that I know about the piano makes no difference in Ananda Maya. I mean, yeah, there's some technical things that are helpful, but the bottom line is that it's just allowing. And it's allowing for us to make the music. It's allowing for the people to receive the music. It's allowing for the connections that happen in that space. Uh, it's allowing for, if we're outdoors, it's allowing for crows to fly over cawing or the wind to come up. Or, you know, one day I had a bumblebee that was like flying around in front of me. <laughs> it's kind of fun. But this is, um, this is the closest, I think, to being an authentic musician that I've come in my life. And that really feels like something, you know? It's completely free of all the mechanical stuff and like the frequencies and the, and the notes and all that technical bullshit. It just doesn't matter. It's just about the experience. And what an incredible experience to be, you know, I'm so humbled to be a part of this, to be able to work with this, you know, there's thousands of years of technology sitting there beside me on the stage and this amazing release, Dion is incredible at this, at being able to release that energy in a way that creates this giant wall of, of beautiful sound. Uh, the details really don't matter, you know? <laughs> it's just being a part of that. So I'll post the links and uh, you guys can watch it. Click them, you'll find a couple of short videos. You can see what it's all about. And I'm, yeah. I'm also gonna post, um, you mentioned John Burke. I wanna post his work and book. Um, Archaeoacoustics. Oh, he's so he, he archaeoacoustics are uh, different. Um, yeah, that's study. a different thing. And then uh, Adam's calendar, I want to throw that one in too, so people can find that. Yeah, I'll be doing some videos on that soon on my Ancient Mysteries on Earth channel as well. Sweet. Um, but uh, yes, uh, seeds of plenty. I know there's something that's part of the title of the book. It's it's all about the. Uh, the yeah, seed of knowledge, stone of plenty, by John Burke. Got it. Um, that is the name of the book. It's it's really amazing. I haven't read the whole thing. I've actually just watched him in interviews talk, talk about it. But um, yeah, he's just he he left too early. He's deceased now. Um, like died quite young. But um, he's his research was just way ahead of its time because it was done like in the 90s and stuff like that and early 2000s and uh anyway it's it's some of the best science we have of what the heck these ancient sites are actually doing it's perfect there's a lot of extensible um rabbit holes off of this episode which is, which yeah. is good we want people to be able to learn this stuff and you know when you want to we need to rabbit holes for it. yeah to find the totally. rabbit holes <laughs> and, and some of them are going to be like that cool sort of city in Turkey where you can stand in one place and you can hear things coming from other places. Yeah. You know, or the, uh, the temple, I forget which one it is in Mexico where you clap at the, 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 you clap when you outside of it at the, uh, the front uh, staircase and you clap and it, the echo that comes back is in the sound of a native bird to that area. It sounds wow. like a bird cry and it, it turns your clap into a different sound. Like, wow. come on, come on. These guys were experts here. Like, that's just so cool. <laughs> we don't know nothing, man, with our trumpets we're, and flutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just trying to figure it out. We're doing the best we can to give ourselves some credit here, you know, but we lots to learn. Lots and lots to learn, for sure. Well, thank you, my friend, for being a pioneer in this. You are truly a, a musical archaeologist, I guess is a good way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or maybe right back at you, Bill. Musicologist? I don't know. <laughs> like, that's going to get very uh, wordy here. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, I like it. No, same to you, Bill. I mean, we're both uh, doing the best we can, and we're, we're curious minds, and we're just uh, – at the end of the day, it's it's really – it's fun and fulfilling work to do, and I feel usually at my most childlike because you just, you're just kind of back in the playpen or the uh, the sandbox, so to speak, and you're, you're, yes. muck, you're mucking around, and you're, you're, you're seeing what works, what doesn't, and the whole journey is really, really fun. As you're experiencing leading these healing, music healing journeys for people, it's – 
very fulfilling to just not have to really you're you're playing what comes to your heart and your mind in that particular moment you don't have to really prepare much you do prepare other things but it's it's a it's a very special different experience than when you're just you're playing a concert which is also beautiful and amazing but um yeah for those listening check out bill's links because you got to see and hear it to really understand it and even just the teaser video is going to put you at ease because the sounds coming out of it are stunning just beautiful thank you my friend appreciate that (laughs) as as we are wont to do as musicians it's great to lift each other up and I also want to lift up the people right now who are curious and looking at things like frequency and how my music works and just all those other things that are questions for you. Go, yeah, do that. And if you want to ask us, you know, ask us anything. We're easy to find. Links in the show notes. And uh, gosh, when do you start this epic journey, Chris? Let's let's end there. Yeah, November. Um, I'll be leaving, and I'll probably start posting stuff mid November. Uh, onwards. And I've already got lots of stuff coming out every week anyway. Um, lots of Egypt and South Africa stuff still. I've got years of content basically backpiled or whatever stockpiled. And uh, yeah, so it's always on the YouTube channel. It's the easiest way to find it. Ancient Mysteries Unearthed YouTube channel. And like Bill said, it's all going to be in the, uh, the show notes. But uh, for those of you listening, ultimately, it's just about staying curious and following your path and your journey is always going to be different than anybody else's. So just take what we've talked about today and, and find the nuggets that resonate with you and, and go uh, on a nice little journey of discovery and let us know what you discover. Yes, if it's appropriate. And if you want to. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> There'll be a test. Another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. What a great way to get back in touch You know, after a couple of weeks. Always the best. I love these conversations. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone listening out there in the world. We love you. We're glad you're here. Love you very much. Thanks, everybody. Aho. Aho. Thank you for listening in on our conversation and for taking time to show your appreciation with a like, share, or subscribe. Discussions of music, healing, and consciousness is a practice of spontaneity, And we welcome your comments, ideas, and questions. There are ways to connect with us in the show notes, so let us hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Protzman along with Chris Noble wishing you great musical health. Samara Huchaya.